Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Joanna Cohn. I'm the director of the Institute for Global Tobacco Control at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. And um, welcome to our monthly Innovations in Tobacco Control seminar series. Uh, for your friends who aren't able to be here, we do a webcast um, the seminars and then put them on our YouTube channel a um, number of weeks later. So they are going to be available, especially if you want to re-review anything that you heard today. So it is my absolute uh, pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Rajiv Ramal. Um, Dr. Ramal is currently professor and chair of the Department of Prevention and Community Health at the School of Public Health at George Washington University. Um, he's, his expertise for, you know, spending over two decades working in the area of health communication and uh, risk communication research. And he's particularly interested in how individuals process risk communication information um, and how societal norms affect behavior. And it's that latter area that he's going to be focusing on today. Uh, a lot of his work has been in the area of HIV AIDS and he's worked in uh, many countries, uh, both domestically, many African countries. And I just noticed uh, from his CV that he's been involved in research in Canada even. So that was exciting to see. Um, uh, his PhD is in communication from Stanford University. He has received a prestigious award from the uh, American Public Health Association, the Everett M. Rogers Award in Public Health Education and Health Promotion. And uh, most importantly for us in, this, in the room today is that he was previously on faculty in the Department of Health, Behavior, and Society for 10 years. And uh, we're sorry he's not with us. Uh, every day now, but he's still, um, you know, not just down the road. So, um, uh, Dr. Ramal is going to talk today um, about his work uh, looking at compliance with um, India's tobacco control legislation. And I'll just mention um, that there will be, uh, for those folks in the room, there'll be lunch available uh, in the back of the room at the end of the lecture. We're just not allowed to be eating in the room. So, um, the floor is yours, Dr. Ramal. Thank Thank you for being here. Uh, thank you, Joanna. Um, and I need to figure out how to get attendance like this in the institution where I am. Um, so it's, it's got to be something about Hopkins, right? Um, uh, so thank you all for coming. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be back uh, at Hopkins uh, in familiar territory. And uh, Joanna was very impressed that I knew how to strap on the mic. Um, uh, and uh, I'm, uh, I guess before I uh, uh, begin my talk, uh, let me mention that uh, to sort of set the bar kind of low, um, uh, tobacco is an area that I find fascinating, I uh, find very interesting. Uh, I've been involved, uh, thanks to mostly to Joanna, uh, through, uh, through the Institute uh, with this work, uh, and this is really the first time that I've dabbled in tobacco. Um, but uh, there are lots of issues around norms, uh, uh, right? If we think about what we have been able to achieve in this country in tobacco control over the last 20, 30, 40 years, uh, one could make the case that um, uh, we've been very successful in changing norms uh, around tobacco and therefore in uh, reducing tobacco use. Um, if we're in an open air setting somewhere and someone lights up, very quickly someone will sort of slap them down. Uh, unfortunately, that's not quite the case with, say, alcohol. Uh, and college alcohol use is a huge problem, we know. But that, that won't be the case if someone pulls out a bottle. No one's going to do that here, right? Okay. <laughs> Um, so uh, just to say that uh, norms around alcohol use, another high-risk substance for particularly for underage users, uh, haven't quite caught up in the same way that uh, norms around tobacco use have. Uh, and uh, today I'm uh, going, to, with that as the backdrop, I'm going to talk much more about um, a particular kind of 
um, norms, if you will, uh, norms that are codified into law. No, uh, so they're not technically not really norms per se, but they're laws. Uh, and in this case, the uh, Cigarettes and Other Tobacco Products Act in India, uh, which has been in effect for uh, uh, a number of years, since 2003. So we were interested in seeing um, what is really the level of compliance with that law in India. And uh, we, uh, in the last two years, we've been trying to figure out, um, you know, can we make some recommendations to the various states in India about how well or poorly they're doing in implementing this Anti-Tobacco Act? Um, so uh, that's been the focus of our work for the last two years, and that's what I'm going to talk about. Uh, so uh, smoking in India is, um, as you can see here, uh, uh, it's the second largest consumer of tobacco in the world, mostly because of its very large population. Uh, prevalence smoking is about 35%, and there are uh, 700,000 deaths per year that are um, attributable to smoking and smoking-related issues. Um, the particular act that I'm going to talk about, called COTPA, which is the Cigarettes and Other Tobacco Products Act, was enacted in uh, 2003. Um, and uh, India it was the seventh country to ratify the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. Um, the act is quite extensive, but uh, I for the projects that we've been involved in, we've really focused on three particular sections of that act, sections four, five, and six. And you'll hear me refer to uh, that, the sections four, five, and six, a uh, number of times today. So what, uh, let me just spend a, just a couple of minutes talking about what these sections pertain to. Section four prohibits smoking in public places. Um, in this particular study, by public places, we're talking about train stations, uh, which um, are pretty big arteries in India for transportation. Uh, government offices, there's uh, supposed to be a complete ban uh, in cinema halls, theaters, as well as hotels and restaurants. And the, the act says that uh, for hotels of a certain size and restaurants of a certain size, they have to segregate smoking and non-smoking sections uh, in their premises. And if you have a smoking section, there are particular rules around uh, what kind of ventilation it has to have, et cetera. Um, I won't go into all those details. But so we were looking at um, you know, how well are the states, these states that we focused on, uh, how well are they doing in um, implementing Section 4? Okay. Same thing with Section 5. Section 5 prohibits advertisements of all kind um, of cigarettes and uh, tobacco, other tobacco products. Uh, which is, for a country like India, it's huge. So that's a huge accomplishment. Um, with just a couple of exceptions um, that you're allowed to advertise on the product itself, so cigarette packs, for example. And uh, at the points of sale, at the entrance of points of sale, and inside these points of sale, if you have a store, walk, store where you can walk into the store, then you're allowed to advertise on the inside. Otherwise, no outdoor ads, um, no uh, ads of any kind in public places. Um, what is interesting to us is when we were out in the field coding for the presence or absence of ads, of tobacco ads, and the first year that we did this, no, actually, I think it was the second year that we did this, um, uh, I uh, uh, received a call from one of our RAs in the field who said, well, you know, we, we're following the guidelines in terms of how to code things, but we see something that we don't quite know how to code. I said, so what is it? And they said, well, um, these are, you know, so they sent us a picture uh, of a product that is not tobacco, but it's all in Marlboro colors. And there's no mention of tobacco. There's no picture of tobacco. There's, uh, uh, there's, uh, I, there's something else that they're advertising that has nothing to do with tobacco, but it's in the same font, the same color scheme, and so on. So, uh, and these are, you know, just that's just one example of how the industry is always one step ahead, it seems, um, in, in their advertisement efforts. Section 6 prohibits the sale of tobacco um, and other products to children in and around educational institutions. Uh, so there's a complete ban uh, within 100 yards of schools. 
uh, of a ban on uh, sale of tobacco as well as advertisement of um, tobacco products, and they're supposed to have no smoking signs um, in those premises. Uh, children are also not allowed to sell tobacco, so these are the different things that we coded for uh, when we did the study. Um, the last review that was done of how well this um, act is being implemented in India showed um, um, mi mixed results, to put it charitably, uh, that um, the Section 5 was established in 21 states, but only three were collecting fines for any uh, violation of those. Um, only 52% of the states had tools for monitoring how well things were going. Um, and uh, half the citizens knew, or you could say half the citizens did not know, about the tobacco control laws. Uh, so what happens when people don't know that you're not allowed to smoke in a particular place is that if someone is smoking, then there's much less likelihood that someone will say, hey, put it down, right? Um, and, uh, but 80% did know about smoking, the, the fact that smoking was banned in public places. So the objectives for our study were uh, to determine compliance with these three sections, how well they're doing. Uh, we also wanted to identify the particular components of this act and venues that were facing particular challenges. Where was it more uh, difficult to implement, for example? And, and then we also wanted to see um, what were the barriers in implementing these laws uh, or this act. And uh, that um, uh, we conducted some qualitative studies to, in order to understand what some of those barriers were. Uh, let me talk a little bit about sampling uh, because it, as you can imagine, for a country the size of India, um, it's a huge challenge on how we do this. And so we opted for uh, going to just five states in this in a sort of initial foray into the evaluation of um, this act. And we opted to find, so um, the mandate, if you will, wa was that we were going to five states. And so we selected those five states um, in, on the basis of their geographical diversity, as well as uh, we chose cities or states uh, w that had large populations. So we tried to balance those two factors and ended up with those five states. So just to give you an idea of um, uh, the state that we're talking about, so Bihar has, is a country. <laughs> it's 103 million people, right, about almost a third of the U.S., and that's just a tiny, that's just this one little state, and it's the size of the Philippines uh, in terms of population. Um, way down south, Karnataka has 61 million people, and it's the size of Italy. Um, and so that was the second state where we were um, uh, sampling. Kerala, the southernmost state, is 33 million, roughly the size of Morocco. Uh, the fourth state that we were in was Maharashtra. This is the state with Mumbai in it. 112 million people, and it's the size of Mexico, population-wise. Um, and then lastly, Rajasthan, uh, which is uh, out in the west, uh, it's a more desert, and that has uh, 69 million people, and that's roughly the size of Thailand. So these were the five states that we um, went into. and. We did sampling in a number of ways. Um, once we selected the states, then we selected the cities. And the, um, in order to figure out which cities we wanted to go into, we really looked for, uh, number one, either the capital, which is often the case, the, the largest city in the state, or if it wasn't the capital, the largest city in the state. We call that the tier one city. Uh, and then the tier two city was another city that was kind of mid-size uh, as cities in India go, roughly half a million to a million people, and we actually ended up with cities that were slightly more than a million for the most part. And then a tier three city, which were the smaller cities, less than half a million people. Okay? Uh, and then um, given that we were going to be in these two cities anyway, we also said, you know, we want to see how smaller suburbs or rural sites are doing. Um, and um, so we, uh, for each of the two largest cities, we also took one proximal uh, city that was much smaller in size, rural. So we would get some sense of you know, how rural cities were doing in comparison to more urban sites. 
So across the five states, then we ended up with 25 cities um, uh, in total. And then, uh, in, so we did that in 2012. That was our year one. In year two, we went back to exactly the same cities to see what had happened in that one year interim. And in fact, uh, to the extent that we could, we went back to even the same sites. And I'll tell you what those sites were. Uh, sites were GPS coded for the most part, and then the next year we went back to the same place. Um, in the second year, we added two more states, Assam and Uttar Pradesh, and these um, are not included in this talk because I'm today going to talk about change over time. Uh, so uh, they form the baseline for subsequent studies if we were to do subsequent studies. Uh, but in Assam, we also did some qualitative work, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, so, um, within each city, um, and so, so bear with me a little bit as I talk about this sampling, because it, you will soon see that it's not a random sample of the country, right? Uh, it's a very, uh, it's a sampling strategy with a particular uh, focus in mind, which is that we really wanted to document what was happening in big urban areas. Um, and so what we did was for section four, which is no smoking in public places, we identified the city center. Quite often, it was the big train center of that city. And we drew a four kilometer radius around that. Uh, we call that the catchment area. And then within that catchment area, we randomly sampled two cinemas. So our um, uh, data collectors first went to that catchment area. They tabulated all the cinema halls that were there. They listed all the cinema halls. And all the government offices and all the other venues Though that list was then sent to Delhi, to the, cent the headquarters of where the data collection company was located. And then there they randomly selected according to the numbers. Uh, and then those, that list was sent back to the data collectors and then those data collectors went to those sites. So there were two cinema halls within each of those catchment areas, two government offices, four uh, small, three medium, and two large restaurants, uh, and then one small hotel and one large hotel. For the most part, that was doable. Sometimes it was not doable because, in particularly in rural areas, you may not have two s cinema halls. So th in that case, they went to the most adjacent um, one. Um, and then they went to the primary train station. So in total, we ended up with 25 train stations, 50 cinema halls, 30 government offices, and 225 restaurants and 30 hotels across the five states. For section five, which is uh, the ban on tobacco advertising, we defined another catchment area. Uh, in this case, it was 300 yards from the primary train station uh, radius. And within that, we coded for all outdoor advertisements that um, were observable to our um, uh, data collectors. And then we also went to all points of sale within that particular catchment area. And uh, for those of you who've been in India, you'll know uh, the complexity of doing this point of sale because Sometimes you have what we elegantly call a mobile point of sale, <laughs> right? What that basically means is you've got a little kid with a little basket walking around uh, uh, with tobacco, or cigarettes, and beaties, and other things, and that is our mobile point of sale. So those things, as you can imagine, were not GPSable. Um, and then the catchment areas in the, so we also went in four directions, north, south, east, and east, and west, two kilometers from the train station. And for in each of those areas, then there was a 100-yard radius from each of those points. And that's where also we coded for all advertisements. And then section six uh, was sale within 100 yards from educational institutions. So in this case, from the center, uh, city center as the hub, uh, we went in four different directions at random distances. Um, and then from each of those points, we selected closest schools, identified to include one primary school and one secondary school, and the closest college uh, from that location. Uh, then once we identified that educational institution, we went to a uh, 100-yard radius around that to, s to code for all these things. Um, all data were collected by our partner in Delhi called IMRB, which is a, a large research firm that has offices in almost every state in India. And so we, um, Aaron is not here, right? Oh, 
she'll hear me. She'll hear about this. Um, uh, so Aaron, wh who, was, who was my graduate assistant at the time, uh, was instrumental in conducting much of this sampling. So I wanted to give her credit, actually. Uh, and so she went to Delhi and trained the data collectors on uh, all of the, this protocol, how to follow the protocol, uh, with uh, a roughly 120-page questionnaire that was uh, in, in detail that you know, for each train station, what do you look for? Where do you stand? So it was all system, very systematic. Uh, so you go to the center of the uh, lobby where they're selling tickets. You look this direction, that direction. You, if there are staircases, you go up the staircases, et cetera, et cetera. Right? So it was a very, very detailed um, protocol that uh, Aaron spent countless days uh, th um, coming up with. So the timeline was uh, in 2012, we did the data uh, wave one. In 2013, almost exactly a year later, we did uh, wave two. Uh, and we went to the same venues whenever possible. Uh, and then in 2013, we added two more states, uh, one of which was a qualitative, where we did the qualitative study. And then we did qualitative studies in two other states uh, that were also the wave one states. So there were three qualitative, um, th uh, three states where we did qualitative studies. OK, so what did we find? Um, observation of smoking. So this is um, in the in each of the public venues. Our data collectors uh, stood there for a specified period of time, and then they just observed how many people they saw smoking. Okay, uh, and we also coded for you know were they smoke were they people in uniform smoking or so in train stations you have all these uh, people who are wearing the uniform right. Uh, so were they staff were they not and so on. I'm not going to bore you with all those details. But in terms of just observation of smoking, um, so what you see is in Bihar, it was 0, 0. So there was nobody observed smoking in public places. And then um, in Karnataka, it, so the smoking prevalence, you know, when you observe, it's not a whole lot, given that 35% of the people smoke. So that's not surprising, right? Uh, but in Rajasthan, so this means it was a statistically significant difference. Uh, so in Rajasthan, from year one to year two, there was a significant increase in the number of people we saw smoking. Okay? And uh, I want you to pay attention to that, Raj to that state because there's a lot of very interesting things happening in that state. Um, I should also mention that in the interim, our partner, um, Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids, was starting to work with government um, offices in, th in the various states and really sort of holding their feet to the fire, so to speak, in implementing many of these regulations. So that's also the interest in seeing whether some of those efforts were percolating upwards in terms of these observations. Um, facilitators of smoking. So we coded for, you know, were there ashtrays? Uh, were there um, uh, smoking uh, stubs that we saw around? Were there ma uh, matches? Were there lighters being made available for uh, people to smoke? Etc. And here uh, we see again that the facilitator is in Bihar, uh, uh, by the way, is one of the poorest states of India. And in many ways, you know, it's, it's, a, uh, it's uh, showing some pretty positive uh, signs. Uh, in Rajasthan, there was a drop in the number of facilitators of smoking, uh, even though there was, right in the previous slide, we saw that there was actually more smokers. So it's hard to tell what came first, whether because there was higher prevalence of smoking, um, there were more uh, facilitators or what. But um, uh, in, uh, in terms of the no smoking signs uh, that we coded for, uh, in uh, Bihar, we saw a significant, they started with zero, and they went up to about 12 or 13%. So there was a significant increase in um, complying with, uh, with having no smoking signs in all the venues where they were supposed to have. Um, in other places, there were increases, but um, given our sample size, they didn't sort of rise to the level of statistical significance. Um, in hotels, did we observe people smoking? Uh, so again, in Bihar, very small number. Uh, and in fact, in um, um, 2012 and 13, they're both about less than 2%. Um, in Karnataka, the same thing. It went from about 2% to 0%. So there's virtually nothing in these four states 
in Kerala, we saw a huge significant increase. Um, and I should say uh, that uh, Kerala actually is uh, the most, the best educated state in the country. It's uh, one of the richest as well. Um, smoking facilitators in hotels, so these are ashtrays and other things like that that would facilitate smoking. Um, so in um, Bihar, it went from what, 11% to nothing. Uh, so Bihar seems to be doing something wonderful is happening in that state. Uh, and then in Rajasthan, also we saw a significant drop. Uh, no smoking signs in hotels. Um, so overall compliance, you can see, is even at the highest level, it's less than 25%. So they're all supposed to have no smoking signs. And they didn't. Most places still don't. And uh, I'll um, talk a little bit about some of the reasons that people provided for that, which I think is kind of interesting. Um, and, uh, but we did see that in Karnataka, for example, there was a significant increase over time. And again, in Rajasthan, there's a significant increase from year one to year two. Smoking in restaurants, um, prevalence is higher than in other places. Um, and that we don't see any change over time. Um, and then in Karnataka, we're seeing uh, fairly high levels, 14, 15% smoking in restaurants. And um, uh, these data, I'm not showing that here, but w uh, we also coded for whether the restaurant was air conditioned or not, which was our proxy for socioeconomic status of the clients. So uh, that uh, um, uh, restaurants with, so with air conditioning were catering to wealthier clients. And we there, uh, it's not showing up here, but when you look at it like that, then there was in fact a significant difference between restaurants that had AC and ones that did not. The ones that did not had higher prevalence of smoking. Um, smoking facilitators in restaurants, um, fairly high, but there's not much difference over time um, from year one to year two. Uh, and then no smoking signs in restaurants um, also Rajasthan started from pretty low and did, uh, had more, significantly more in year two. Uh, but otherwise, it's still, the highest was what, 27, 26%. So there's lots of room for, imp for improvement there as well. Uh, so outdoor ads for tobacco. Uh, and here, um, you know, there's, a, there's supposed to be a complete ban. So we're actually supposed to see nothing here. Uh, and in um, Maharashtra, that went from 28% of the sites to none. Pretty good. In Kerala, there was none at all. So, uh, uh, so they seem to be able to enforce that really well. Uh, Bihar was, uh, we saw uh, an increase. In Karnataka also, it went, what, from 17% to zero, and not much change in Rajasthan. So there's still, uh, and this is something, uh, outdoor uh, ads are something that we feel is probably uh, easier to uh, enforce, uh, but we're not seeing full compliance there. Uh, and then we also coded whether tobacco was accessible to minors or not. So this was um, coded in terms of at points of sale were tobacco products, or in normal stores, I should say, were tobacco products at the eye level of kids and were tobacco products being uh, juxtaposed next to candy and other attractive things. So there's a, a few ways that we coded whether they were being accessible to kids or not. Um, and in Bihar, there was a significant drop from what, 50 some odd percent to 30 per something percent. And in Rajasthan, there was also a significant drop in making uh, tobacco inaccessible to minors. Uh, and then no smoking signs near educational institutions. Um, this is a huge challenge um, because in qualitative studies that we did, they, uh, school administrators kept talking about the fact that you know, they didn't have the authority to impose that. And uh, it's not clear to me as to who really needs to enforce this because uh, the schools are saying it's not, it's not our responsibility. Um, and uh, so there's not a, uh, in, in Bihar, there was an uh, improvement from 2012 to 13 that was significant. In Kerala, there was a significant improvement. But even then, what 25, highest was 27% of the venues that had 
uh, no smoking signs. Uh, sale of tobacco near educational institutions is a pretty huge problem. Uh, and you know, in uh, many urban areas, uh, when you're talking about 100 yards within an educational institution, um, I can see why that would be challenging because then you're talking about catering to lots of people, lots of offices, office buildings, and so on. Uh, but that's the law. Uh, and um, uh, so uh, sale of tobacco there within it, 100 yards of educational institutions, that's pretty high across the board. Yeah. We did it from the outer borders of the institution. So uh, sometimes the schools will have compounds that have walls around them, right? So we'd go 100 yards from each of those. Um, and, and in Kerala, we're seeing a drop, but even that is from 70 to 50%. Uh, then uh, given all this, we uh, in the second year said, you know, let's try to figure out you know, what are some of the uh, facilitators and barriers to uh, implementing uh, these regulations. And so we uh, went to three of the states, uh, to Assam, Bihar, and Karnataka, and uh, did some um, qualitative studies there. Uh, just to show you, the new state was, uh, was um, uh, Assam, which is a northeast state with a population of 31 million. The other states were the ones that I've talked about already. So here we did uh, in-depth interviews uh, with hotel owners and uh, managers, with restaurant owners, with tobacco retailers, law enforcement officials, cops who had sort of the, their tobacco beat on the street, uh, and then uh, school principals and administrators to try to figure out you know, what, what, what they were having problems with. So in the hospitality industry, in the hotels and restaurants, they wish to avoid conflicts with customers which you can understand. And uh, in particularly in five-star hotels, guests felt had a sense of entitlement, and the hotel owners were very reluctant to tell guests not to smoke. Uh, and one person said it's their freedom. Their freedom should not be taken over. This is a rich clientele. Uh, and hotel rooms were seen as private spaces that even if the hotel had a non-smoking room, uh, the hotel owners or managers were reluctant to say, you know, do not smoke in your room, because they saw that as sort of private venues for the um, uh, guests. Uh, in terms of facilitators, um, uh, there was less likely to be smoking if there were cameras or sprinkler systems. Uh, that was interesting. Uh, in uh, restaurants with air conditioning, uh, there was the tended to be almost no smoking. And I think it has something to do with the fact that you have air blowing into a closed venue, so people were less reluctant to smoke. Um, uh, and then providing a family-friendly ambience in, ambience in restaurants. And what the quote here is that, because we were losing our family and female customers, and they hesitated to come here, so finally we decided to ban it completely, was the restaurant owner's quote. Um, Public awareness of the regulations were uh, thought to be facilitated. So in other words, uh, many of these hotel owners and restaurant owners would say, well, if people knew that this was not uh, allowed, then it would be much easier for me to enforce that law. Um, and signage facilities, um, many hotel owners would say, well, if they gave me aesthetically pleasing signs, I would put it up. Right? That I don't want to spoil the decor by having these handmade signs. And so that might be one interesting implication is that if you want these signs, provide them. Uh, and that actually came up even with tobacco retailers, which I'll show you in just a second, um, uh, that um, that was their complaint was that we don't have these signs. Um, so for, as you can understand, uh, for tobacco retailers, the barriers were fear of loss of revenue. Um, uh, that they saw children as customers, and so not to sell to children was uh, they're going to be deprived of their revenue. Um, they also felt that the, they were going to lose out on the reimbursements provided by the tobacco companies for putting up their signs, putting up their advertisements. Um, 
Gutka is a, there's a complete ban on Gutka, which is a sort of form of chewing tobacco that's sweet and it's really catering to kids. Um, uh, and that's a uh, source of revenue for them. Um, and sale of tobacco also results in the sale of other products. So when people come to buy cigarettes, they also buy something else. Um, uh, some expressed fear of retaliation from customers. Um, and, and they said, well, yeah, we would post these signs if we were given. Uh, some of the faci facilitators, um, that uh, they saw that uh, if, if this was enforced uh, more rigorously by cops, then they would be more willing to go along. And interestingly, when the retailers had personal beliefs that tobacco was bad, for women and children, then they were less likely to, they were more likely to say, yes, okay, I'll think of uh, going into some other business. Um, so one of the quotes here is, if these things are banned, then there will be definitely loss for us, but there will be benefits for the general public, so we would like it to be banned. But I can't be the only one not selling. That's sort of the message. In the educational institutions, uh, the school officials said, well, you know, it's not really my job. I don't have the authority. I put up these signs. I put it up once or twice. It got put down. It got sort of taken down or damaged. So therefore, I'm not going to invest more energy in doing that. Um, and uh, some of the facilitators were the perceived characteristics of the schools and the school management's actions. In other words, if the schools thought of themselves as sort of being somewhat elite and catering to a different kind of uh, students, then they were much more likely to. Uh, enforce the anti-smoking uh, rules. Uh, and then uh, there were a couple of instances where they said, well, I'm not going to be the only one, but if we band together with other schools in the area, then I'd be much more likely to comply. Uh, and then when we talk to cops on the street, um, some of the barriers were they sort of put up their hands saying, no, I can't enforce this. It's uh, just the public is not going along. Uh, the retailers were hiding their products, which is actually quite true. In fact, when, um, uh, when we were doing the training for the, in the second year, I was actually in, uh, in Bangalore, and we were out on the street um, sort of trying to identify shops that were uh, tobacco uh, outlets. And I remember walking down the street and saying, oh, there are none here. When my RAs actually said, uh-uh, you'd be surprised. Even this juice store is actually selling tobacco from sort of under the table, literally. Right? So, um, a lack of awareness about the law among the public was sort of the cops' perceptions that people don't know about the law, and therefore it's hard for me to enforce it. And most interestingly, I'm not given a book of citations where I can you know, write people a ticket. So if you give me that book of citations, I'm much more likely to enforce the law. Um, and if it's f uh, prioritized by the departments, they were more likely to do it. And again, a greater awareness among the public. So some of the conclusions, um, a lot of work to be done. As you can see, there's a lot of variation um, across states. Uh, some states are doing a much better job than others. But even then, uh, overall uh, compliance with the law, there's, there's a lot of work to be done. Uh, and particularly in terms of uh, these no smoking signs, which I uh, found to be very interesting. Because on the one hand, you could say, well, you know, if there's a someone who's going to smoke, Surely a sm uh, no smoking sign is not going to deter them from smoking. They'll find a way. But at yet, at sort of a population level, they serve many different functions. I came away actually being a fan of these signs that, um, yes, they may deter smoking, but they really empower other people to enforce the rules. And I think that's, that's probably where they're most powerful. Um, but um, it needs to be provided um, for retailers and others. Access to minors is, seems like a huge issue. Um, uh, sale and signage near educational institutions is uh, still a lot of work to be done. Uh, attractions in points of sale, they have these neon lights and all these other things to entice kids uh, in the points of sale. Uh, and uh, in outdoor advertisement, we saw lots of variation across the states. And that seems like something that is much more readily enforceable. Um, some of the limitations, these are pretty small sample sizes, just given the size of the country and the number of venues. 
Uh, it's mostly limited to urban sites. Uh, we didn't go to um, um, you know, the big swath of the country that has lots of rural um, areas. And this is, of course, just a snapshot of just two points in time. Um, and lastly, I want to thank all the people who made this possible uh, for this really important work. Um, and just a shout out to all of them. So let me stop there. I'm happy to answer any questions. folks in my discipline get um, the message that health education and health communication is a nice additional component, but that if you really want to have significant behavior change, you should focus on the whole human approach. And I think what you're showing here is that there's never just one approach that works. We always need to work in a complementary fashion. Um, so here, there was legislation and policy in place, but it doesn't sound like there was a significant communication campaign or health education campaign to talk about the new policy. So could, could you clarify actually what was communicated and what you think might be appropriate or, or how changes could be facilitated with an improved social marketing campaign or individual health ed strategy? Uh, to the last point, I'll start that first. Can I get you to repeat the question, please? Because we're recording. Sure. So let me repeat the question. Uh, the question was um, that uh, uh, quite often we hear that it's just policy that needs to be in place and that health communication and marketing are just add-ons. Um, so could you comment on whether that's the case or not and what do people really know about the uh, act in India? Did I do justice to your question? Okay. Uh, so um, uh, I think you put your finger on the pulse because in fact in one of the manuscripts that we've uh, put together on this our recommendation was that there needs to be a social marketing campaign to go along with this policy level um, uh, 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 policy in the country. And um, in fact, when we initially wanted to sample cops, the police, for this study, one of the uh, inclusion criteria was that the, the, the police know about COTPA. And we had to abandon that because they did not know what COTPA was. Uh, we in the public health community know this act, right? Even by its acronym, God forbid. Uh, but um, uh, most uh, people do not, in fact, know what that is. They have a vague sense that, yeah, there's, there's laws, right? That I'm not allowed to smoke in, in public. Uh, but you know, if you go to a train station in India and you look at the tracks, and you'll see lots of cigarette butts. Uh, so clearly the norms haven't you know, come around to that yet, um, and lots of our uh, participants in the study said, no, people have, you have to raise awareness uh, among people that in fact they're not allowed to smoke in public. Uh, so it's, I think it's that interaction, the action really is in the interaction in that, you know, it's when the public policy and people's awareness come together, then you'll really see, you know, a multiplicative effect. We're not there yet in India. So in fact, the, you know, the, the COTPA, uh, regulation has been in force for 11 years. It was in force in 2003, right? It's just that we did this study in 2012 and 13, but uh, it's been in force for all these years, but it's not, clearly it's not, um, you know, really uh, sunk in yet in the country. And the other thing to say is that um, uh, India is a signatory to the global, uh, right, treaty. Uh, and you know, you also wonder: Does the cop on the beat on the street in Bangalore have a sense of ownership about this policy that was formulated many hundreds of miles from where he or she lives? So there's also that kind of ownership, I think, that needs to be conveyed as well. I was wondering if you could speak to um, anything around cessation services and, and the scope of cessation within the law, because you know it's it's one thing to have a health education campaign and have enforcement, but then what do you do with the people who might feel stigmatized that they're smokers or want to quit and they don't have the resources? So um, 
India is um, a country where there's a huge imbalance in, by gender in terms of smokers, right? Uh, males are much more likely to smoke than females. Uh, we also know that um, uh, by, if you look by SES, socioeconomic status, uh, for people in the lower uh, socioeconomic status bracket, there are real cheap biddies and other products available uh, that um, you know, is available in abundance. Uh, so we know that there is a big difference by socioeconomic status. Uh, in terms of uh, cessation, sure. I mean, that also has to go hand in hand with all these other efforts. Uh, but uh, cessation is not something that actually came up. You know, it, it, in all our interviews, hardly anybody talked about cessation. Now, there was some sense, some people talked about, um, oh, it's tough for people not to smoke because they're addicted. So that did come up a couple of times. Uh, but there wasn't this sense that if those cessation services are provided, that they, you'll have larger uptake. I think it was much more, at least when you talk, when you think about, you know, the. Uh, the data that we got from the retailers and the cops and so on, uh, it was much more around, you know, the, the behaviors in public spaces. And that's what they cared about, that, you know, even if you are a smoker, just don't smoke here. That was much more the sense than, you know, can we do something to facilitate you quitting. Is that all right? Yeah. So in a context like India, where there's so many cultural factors at play, and uh, and, and I don't know if this study is done, because these have been laws passed in a lot of countries and developed countries where they, uh, the communication may not be the same, but once the law is passed, it's just much more effective. Whereas here, there's a sense of, s not civil disobedience, but uh, much more about, well, civil issues and care about other people's because it's just the, the culture of the country not to care about everything from laws around littering and all of that. So is that your sense that you got that people, was that a dominant factor as well in terms of people's response to why should we care? Um, I'm not sure uh, I can say that we detected that kind of apathy. Um, I think it was much more the case that um, the existence of the law is not communicated properly to people. Uh, so, you know, for this, this, the name of this law does not mean anything to 95, 98% of the people, probably even more. Uh, so, you know, they have a vague sense that they're not supposed to smoke in certain places, but they see people smoking. Uh, so, you know, in terms of just uh, what is normative, that it's normative that you can buy loose cigarettes, it's normative that when you go to a, a booth that is selling tobacco, that there is a, you know, thing hanging from the ceiling where you put your cigarette to light it up, you know, there's a lighter that's available. So all these things communicate that, eh, yeah, there's the law, but it's okay, right? So it's sort of not caring for the law, maybe that's what you meant, yeah, yeah. Uh, Um, well, but th there are certain laws that are enforced. So I think in terms of tobacco, perhaps that's more the case, that you know, there, it hasn't been a priority yeah. as much perhaps as in many other countries. And our colleagues at CTFK, Campaign for Tobacco Free Kids, and that's one of the things they do is they work with state governments and health, health you know, ministers and so on to really sort of hold their feet to the fire and say, you have to enforce these laws and then facilitate doing that. And you know, they keep tabs of how many tickets were written every month and things like the enforcement, things like that. So, um, so in that sense, yes, I mean, there is clearly a lot of work to do at the state, local level, yeah. There's so much going on. It's really, um, really interesting to hear about the different um, states. W one thing I wondered about, you. you s Explain that in India, about 35% of people uh, smoke tobacco. Is that both cigarettes and BDs, or just cigarettes? I think that's both. That's uh, both, okay. Yeah. And one of the things that sort of struck me, there was distinct differences across some of the states. And I know different states use different tobacco products more or less commonly. So did that factor into your decision on where to conduct 
the research were like a place like Bihar, you said, is one of the poorer states. So presumably cigarettes may be used less there than other forms of tobacco. Is that a fair assumption? Um, there is variation in, uh, in uh, prevalent in, uh, smoking across the states, no question. Um, our, but for our purposes, it wasn't that so much. It was really A, you know, uh, uh, go to these big states. B, where was some of the work that CTFK was either already doing or about to start? Uh, and then we also tried to sort of balance geographical diversity. So that, those were much more the motivations for selection of these, city, these states than, than real smoking prevalence. And, and during the time that you were in the field, that's when a lot of the Gukuk bans were being yep. implemented. D yep. Did that seem to impact other sort of tobacco use in, in your field? Or was that outside of the scope of what you were yeah, doing? We, yeah, we did not look for that. But, um, but that would be a very interesting hypothesis, that uh, after you ban Gutka, there, you know, was there a sort of concomitant rise in yeah, tobacco use? This is really, obviously, really interesting and exciting work. And I have a question that is a bit like Eileen's question, and but it's changing the lens a little bit. If we think of, normally, this notion that we have to have a, um, you know, a public education campaign that will increase awareness, knowledge, perhaps attack attitudes in order to begin to affect norms and that practices will follow. This structure is if you can change practices through um, regulation and, and enforcement of that regulation, and the signage is really interesting because that in itself could be a public information campaign. You can't do this here. So the kind of cognitive dissonance, uh, you know, cycle would say you change practices and then attitudes and you know norms will come in line with the practices. And at least in one of your qualitative notions, it was women and families don't like it when there's you know smoking, so we want to make it more friendly for them. And so there's you know so we'll go along with this practice because it might you know be beneficial in that way. So I, what I think would and I don't know if you've measured it. I wouldn't be surprised if you haven't. But if you have some measure of norms, however you're going to look at norms regarding acceptability of smoking in these public places, in your baseline observations, before you institute any kind of public service campaign, it would be really interesting to see whether you're shifting that, si not simply, but by you know, upping your game on, reinfor on enforcement mm -hmm. and signage. That in itself might, in fact, change norms and actually make people much more receptive to the public service, uh, you know, kind of campaigns about why you should change your norms, because in fact they've already gone down that road. So um, I I agree with you. I think there is this sense of the broken window phenomenon that when you see um, you know, things are not being enforced when you see that there are lots of cigarette butts where there's not supposed to be, and you see cops walking around without really, you know, calling people on that, then you, the sense you get is that, hey, it's, it's okay. I can do it and get away with it. Everybody's doing it. They're not getting caught, right? So, so there is certainly that. But I think uh, what the cops and the others were saying is that help us enforce this law by communicating to the public that it's not okay, right? That they're not supposed to do this. Uh, and, um, you know, the, in, in communication um, circles, they, they talk about this influence of presumed influence um, phenomenon, which is that when you put out a message, uh, then you know that others have heard that message. So you, I now know that you know that you're not supposed to smoke because after all, you must have seen it on TV, right? And therefore, it's easier to enforce that. So I think, I think what you're saying is exactly right. I mean, that, that you know, this, there is this sense that the behaviors, if you enforce the behaviors, that will change the norms. And once those norms begin to change, then that will further enforce the, be the behavior. So it's, it's definitely, you know, um, uh, uh, iterative. 
I was wondering about um, cultural differences between the states. Um, I was struck by the tables that you showed between 2012 and 2013. There were some states that seemed to be real outliers in yeah. the change. And so I was wondering about the cultural differences that might have increased adherence or created barriers, and, and if you uncovered that in your qualitative interviews. Um, that's a great question. Uh, we, uh, we, we didn't dig into that phenomenon, uh, but uh, I think the sense uh, uh, in our team was that if we went to the southmost state, right, and then we go to the northeast, and then we go to the northwest, we are going to tap into those cultural differences for sure, and I'm sure we did. Uh, and you know, included in the sample were two, you know, Kerala, which is has the highest education level in the country, and Bihar, which is sort of at the other extreme. Although things are happening there very rapidly recently, um, and uh, even in terms of um, uh, religion that also sort of creates differences. So one's predominantly Hindu, <coughs> other one has a big Christian population. Uh, so there are those differences now. What part of that cultural difference, you know, did we really tap into? <coughs> that I can't say. Uh, but um, uh, I think in terms of, you know, uh, it's not just the wealth or the culture of the state, it's also the the uh, prioritization of the health minister and the ministry in that state. Uh, so one of our partners who's done you know, tobacco advocacy work extensively in India uh, told me a, sort of an anecdote of you know, how he changed the behavior of the chief minister in one of the states by pointing out that the chief minister's some close relative had died of cancer. Uh, and it wasn't even lung cancer. It was, you know, I forget, some other cancer, right? Uh, but he used that to say, well, you know, don't you want to do something about cancer? And, you know, this is a big killer, you know, it's a source of cancer, so you've got to ban advertising. And he tells the story of the chief minister being in this meeting with all these retailers of tobacco and saying, in th I give you three days. I don't want to see any advertising in my state. That was it. So there are those kinds of things as well. And I think that's why this on the ground work is so critical. You know, the, the work that CTFK and others are doing is absolutely critical for this kind of thing. I forget. Um, here, maybe? Microphone? Okay, sure. I think this will be the last one. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. Um, I was wondering, I'm not sure if this is within the scope of the study, but if you found a correlation um, with alcohol use in points of sales of tobacco or tobacco use such as in restaurants where there may be bars? Uh, great question. Uh, and uh, no, the, the short answer is no, we didn't collect that data, but I can tell you that uh, in, um, so those of you who know um, India will recognize this, that drinking in many parts of India is kind of stigmatized, drinking in public. And in fact, in many middle class restaurants that serve alcohol, the drinking part of the restaurant is dimly lit. It's kind of out in the corner. And there is this kind of stigma around drinking. Now, why that is important is that uh, drinking establishments or so establishments that provide alcohol are very easily, easy to locate. They're, they're distinctly, they're sort of different, just physically. Uh, and Around those establishments, uh, there are mobile vendors all the time. So there are these vendors who have cigarettes. You know, you'll see that when you come out of a bar, first thing that will greet you will be a kid in a little you know, tray selling uh, Lucy's. So, um, so in that sense, there's absolutely, I, I would imagine that there would be a pretty strong correlation uh, because we know even from research from elsewhere that when people drink, they tend to smoke more, right? Um, so uh, that we probably would find a, a good correlation if we were to do that. So um, thank you all very much. This was very enjoyable. <laughs>